Yeah, so I know I put up this kind of ridiculous topic today called data terrariums, which is meant to be provocative and get y'all thinking about sort of outside the box solutions. Because our goal with it was to sort of imagine achieving perfect compute efficiency. This idea that every ounce of energy or every watt of energy that goes in goes directly to compute in just 200 watts of sunlight. So I want to start by breaking down the analogy of what's a terrarium or what are terraria. And it's that they're sealed ecosystems powered by sunlight. The only input is solar energy and occasional care. You know, sometimes you, tr you prune things or you, you trim them, you add a little water in. And they're carefully balanced water and life cycles of all the component organisms within them. And when they're balanced and sealed, terraria can last for decades. So this one here is about 47 years old. And it's the world's second oldest terrarium. The record's around 60 years. You know, when we think about these things, we don't just you know, build them without principles. We, we really think about what are our restrictions, and those restrictions lead to innovation, or as Plato once said, necessity is the mother of all inventions. So rather than asking, how would I grow as many things as possible? How do I scale infinitely? How do I grow exactly what I want in this environment that's not suited for it? I really think, what can I build within my ecosystem? What can I adapt uh, into this space that is limited? You know, I have some amount of solar energy, but, you know, the solar density, the energy density of the sun is not, like, infinite. Um, and it varies depending on where you are, and then how do I balance that with soil, bacteria, plants, water, and how do I produce beauty and life and sort of recycle waste within this cycle? And as I was thinking about this, and Kaola and I were talking about this a lot, we thought, well, why can't we design data centers the same way? And I believe that in futurism, there's only two answers to this question, and it's a lot like improv, and it's yes and not with current technology. I, I really don't think there are a lot of things that are impossible on an infinite time scale. And so I think we can do this, and I thought we could do this today. So that's great, we can, but why? <laughs> and I think it's, you know, when we look at things like this, it's because this is unsustainable. Like building these huge data centers, this is the Apple data center in Mesa, Arizona. And you look at it, and it's got these storage tanks outside for water, because you'll notice in this picture, there is none. And there's no solar here. You know, they're pulling energy from the local grid. They're pulling water from the the irrigation systems, the drinking water of the local towns. This building supports maybe a couple hundred jobs, realistically, and it's storing data that, you know, as people's selfies, you know, it's not necessarily critical data all the time. And it's, it's a big problem. Communities are starting to push back against this because they're like, what do I get in exchange for this sort of bargain that takes up a lot of resources? And why, you know, like, why do we design things this way? And this problem is getting worse. It's still growing, you know. We're seeing um, across the world increasing amounts of energy. Um, this plot here, which I forgot my clicker actually, but um, the plot on the right, if you look at the sort of inset on my side showing Denmark and Ireland, this is the percent of national energy estimated to go towards data centers. So in Ireland, it's already above 10%, and it's estimated to go to 28%. The latest figure I've seen is 22% for 2024. So a fifth of national energy is supporting data centers. And it's not something that most people talk about every day. You know, you don't go to a coffee shop and, you know, you hear, you know, the lights go out and you're not like, oh, well, you know, the data center's on again. You know, you're like, there's a hurricane or a bird got, you know. <laughs> and I, I think that this we is, do. we do. We do. And the students, we <laughs> the students we teach do. So this is really important. The other thing is this problem's growing, you know. This, and it's not growing at a small rate. You know, it's growing at 10% a year. And so... It's already 4% of US energy consumption, which is roughly the equivalent in terawatt hours as, a, as the aviation industry. So it's just an insane amount of energy that no one's really like, you know, thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis, except for us. And in addition to that, it's also sort of this era of sovereign AI. There's been this big push in you know, a lot of branding from a lot of companies, um, as well as from these national level organizations to to build what they're calling sovereign AI, which is this notion of like a, uh, a country or a sovereign state should have um, control over its data and also the AI that is, that is derived from that data. So I asked perplexity, how do communities benefit from sovereign AI and why does every community deserve access to it? And it actually provided what I think is a very satisfactory answer, which is they deserve data privacy and security. They deserve cultural and contextual relevance. They deserve a model that represents them within its it's sort of a context window. They ha need economic and technological independence. Uh, it allows them to make informed decisions based on their own knowledge. It, pro it promotes ethical and responsible use of data if they have control of it. And then lastly, it enhances collaboration and innovation because they can share those models at their choosing with other groups 
Um, so this is a very powerful thing. And frameworks for this already exist. So indigenous scholars have studied this past, present, and future, created these sort of global frameworks to talk about Bill of Rights and how do we handle this um, at a global distributed scale. So now we have a why, and now we have to get to the how of this question. And I think the first thing we looked at was, you know, remember we talked about the restrictions within a terrarium sort of define how we build it. So we had to think about what are the restrictions when we build a data center? And really what goes in and out of a data center is power. Usually we measure it in kilowatts or kilowatt hours, which is a sort of power over time. And then you can calculate efficiency in two ways. You can now use PUE, which is uh, this crazy ratio that essentially your goal is to get to one and it's very hard to understand because 1.07 is a good score, but 1.2 is a bad score, and that's sort of meaningless. So I think data center infrastructure efficiency is better. Um, it's a better way to communicate it. And so it's interesting, you'll see a lot of the hyperscalers don't report this, but it's literally the percentage of power used for compute and storage. And so it's easier to think about 90% of my power goes directly to compute and storage versus, you know, I scored a 1.07 on an arbitrary score. And then you also have water and air for cooling, other systems, as well as space. So once we've sort of measured our entities, we know our restrictions, we have to imagine within it. So you know, we thought about how do you imagine a self-contained Dago ecosystem? How do you imagine one powered by the sun that fits in a reasonable amount of space, that can go where people need it, and that can accomplish what they need it for? And then we have to understand the basic components. So if we have that purpose for doing it, and we have our restrictions, then how do we get there? And you know, we really thought about this terrarium analogy and how sunlight and energy storage is a lot like plant photosynthesis. You're taking an energy from the sun, you're converting it into some other uh, stored energy. Uh, you have things that consume that, like in this case GPUs and other PCs, and then you have a container, which you know is usually a, a glass jar, or in our case, this lovely shopping cart. And then we had to build it. So you know, only then is our really our terrarium analogy complete. And when you think about it, the inputs are solar energy. It has a light to power converter, just like plants do. It has carbon to knowledge converters, just like bacteria or things. They're producing these sort of byproducts from inputs. And the outputs are again art, knowledge, and beauty. So it is it is a terrarium in this sort of analogy framework we've built. And then it's you know it's a question of okay, what does 200 watts buy us? What can we do with it? And you know, just some examples. This is, these are real examples that you, know, you can run on this exact system. You can do a whole genome analysis in 45 minutes on a single GPU that's faster than AWS. You can do a whole exome analysis in four minutes. That's about the same as AWS, but remember you're doing it with no energy inputs, no water, nothing, just sunlight. Uh, you can serve an eight billion parameter large language model like Llama 3, and it can write poems, it can answer questions, it can even generate code for you on the fly. Um, which is amazing because then you can do bootstrapping. So you can imagine telling it, hey, I want to accomplish this thing, and it can kind of guide you through the process of building tools to then query it further. Uh, you can run stable diffusion to generate images and logos, and then you can create personalized AI systems with the data stored on device. So data never leaves, you don't need the cloud, you don't need internet. You can bring your data, say on a hard disk, put it in a vector database, and you can have local querying of this thing. And so you, you really have increased the amount of local, powerful, personalized AI you can do pretty tremendously in a very small amount of space, money, um, and like energy. And so, you know, what sort of future does this build towards? You know, what is the, you know, this is the present, but where does this go? Well, I think the conclusion is that individual groups as small as just a single person start to have access to powerful co-intelligence models. You know, you can imagine loading this thing up with your data and then having this sort of context over many years maybe of your life if you're a prolific writer to go back to. You can think of protected data and sovereignty that's independent of energy, internet infrastructure, and water. You know, it's literally just whatever I bring with me is what I need to, to have this model running. And lastly, it's sort of this, this model to think about how do we do small scale AI deployments where resilience, low latency, and data privacy matter. So, not necessarily that everyone's gonna build a data terrarium and carry it around, but really like how do we take these same principles in this prototype and learn from them and then deploy them at you know, slightly larger scale? How do we grow this? How do we think about these principles rather than just hyperscaling and building a giant data center in the desert for the best tax incentives and just stopping there? You know, how do we really take and learn from this? And you know, as we thought about where do we go from here, Keolu and I have been working on a series of projects, and I'll kind of go through them, but they're all sort of this under this earth-friendly computation umbrella, which is really thinking about how do we make compute and storage uh, friendlier to the environment, maybe even work in concert in a positive way with it. So first things first, get students and teachers excited and learning and experimenting. 
Uh, we have a um, symposium at Pacific Symposium on Biocomputing in Kohala, Hawaii, uh, this coming January, which we're super excited about. You can check out the details of that on our website. Um, we ran an Earth-Friendly Computing Seminar. This was really cool. It kind of formed organically. We put it out there, and we had about five to ten students every two weeks for the whole spring semester doing these bi-weekly projects like Fermi estimation, so calculating when data centers could overtake cars as the number one consumer of fossil fuels, um, bringing their favorite calculator or measuring device, and then designing calculators to convince people to pay attention to this data center usage problem and then bring a piece of art that captures their attention and pushes a message, especially at Earth-Friendly Computing. So really, how do we get people thinking about these things and iterating on it and you know, producing things artistically that move the needle on actually changing the sort of course of this? Uh, I went down to Mexico and built a small-scale system for genomic sovereignty. So this is a single GPU that took us from one genome per week to one genome every two hours. And what that meant for the International Lab of Human Genetics was that things that were going to take them a full year, they could do in three weeks. And I taught the students and professors how to use it. We hung out. I had a really good time, honestly. It was just a lot of fun. It took about two days. It was less than $10,000 to get all this up and running. And now they're freed from the cloud and cluster constraints, and they're empowered to upgrade and repair it. So like, they know what parts are in it. We all signed it. We all have our hands on it. It's covered in fingerprints. And it was super fun. It was really cool to see you know, when something breaks, they have the ability to go back and repair it. Uh, there's also this notion of the, or this other project, the EFC MAP project, which is designing data centers in concert with the environment rather than uh, in concert with some other factor. But thinking about, you know, we build Terraria with these components and styles suited for the local environment. And why can't we plan and build data centers the same way? There's no reason that we can't do it differently. And so imagining sort of a, a future where, you know, we, we sort of tailor these data centers to the local environment, the local context, sort of vernacular architecture, those sorts of things. What's available to us and where they would thrive and perform best. Um, taking that even a step further is thinking about EFC 574, which is sovereign AI for all native peoples in the U.S. So there's 574 recognized tribes within the area occupied by the U.S. And every single one of them can have the beginnings of data and AI self-determination today. And it would cost between 0.1 and 1% of a single Google data center, depending on which data center you pick. Council Bluffs, Iowa, about a $5 billion data center. So you know, about 0.1% the cost of that, you could drop the ability to do personalized AI in each of these, um, these tribal sovereign regions. Um, and then lastly, and kind of the most radical, is thinking about EFC minus one, which is this imagining a transition from carbon emissive or carbon positive to carbon neutral compute and eventually all the way to carbon negative data computation storage. You know, how do we get there? I found this one really amusing because I asked AI, or I asked ChatGPT to imagine first a data center and the inputs that go into it, and it did a really good job. We've got water, power, CO2 out, pretty good. The data terrarium, it nailed the logo. I'm really happy with that one, actually. <laughs> Thank you, ChatGPT. This last one is asking it to imagine a carbon negative future for data storage and computation. And what you see is it cannot imagine it. It has hallucinated this carbon negative complication. The sun is labeled carbon. Um, CO2 is in this cycle. And so I think what it'll take is human creativity and knowledge to really break out of this. And we'll have to, we'll have to try some new things that we haven't tried before to, to really get there. But I think it's possible. And if it's not possible today, it might be possible in the future. And so with that, I will just say that Earth-friendly computation is possible. And thank you guys for listening today.